Bingo. Um, a lot of these other ones are really only used in certain certain situations or as you get further along in chemistry or biology, some of these other ones will show up. Um, but, but for the most part, the biggest one that I see people mix up is they call, uh, if the uh, procedure says beaker, people go grab the early Meyer class, the conical one, because that's what the chemistry glass word looks like. You know, beaker is a chemistry glass word. Um, um, they're not the same thing. Sometimes that mix up my throwy wall. So watch out for that. Um, and then the other handout that got background is the conversion sheet and the equation sheet that also is the same as the one that would be given on the midterm. If you add me for Chem 100, this one's got a few more equations on it. It's a little bit more in-depth um, because we do more math and we get more in-depth in, in this class. But for the most part, it should look pretty similar to one we've seen before. Um, and if you wanted to print your own version or if you lose yours and want to find one, uh, leave under resources and study tools. In big, big letters, right? Official equation sheet for final exam. Official periodic table for final exam. Um, so use those if you need them. Like I said, there are some. There are lots of other versions here. Um, for instance, P table is a really cool one that uh, is interactive. You can click and you can change things. Like, okay, um, I want to display it based on. Uh, melting points. So the lowest melting points are the ones that are in blue. The highest melting points are the ones in red. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of cool stuff like that. And they have a downloadable PDF version as, um, as well. Um, but just, you know, those, some of those other resources are, are posted here. I don't have a link to the glassware one. I'll put the glassware figure up here. Um, anyway, so anything else I need to talk about for that? I don't think so. All right, so do some random quiz questions and we'll talk about the course. People have questions about the course specifically. Um, go away. Um, uh, several of you asked what uh, where I went to school. I went to a really small private school in San Diego uh, called Point Loma, um, mostly because it, it got uh, I tested well enough in high school. I was able to get a, a decent scholarship there, so I could go to school and not go into debt. Um, so, oh, instead of going to debt to go to Berkeley or UCLA for chemistry, I went to this tiny school, and it didn't hurt that my dorm was less than 100 yards from, from one of the best surf breaks in San Diego. Um, that was a lot of fun. I failed my, not failed. Um, my first non-A grade in college was that first semester in college because I had a night class. I um, principles of human communication was a night class. And instead of studying for the midterm, I said, it's communication. How hard can it be? And I'm serving instead. Um, so don't do that, but I totally get um, powder days, just so you're aware. Um, and then from there, I went to grad school in uh, University of Colorado in Boulder. So I got big, big research um, experience for my grad school and small liberal arts school for my undergrad. So I've kind of done both of those. It was really, really fun to go into a party school already being 21, as opposed to if I was 18, then I'm sure, you know, would have spent way more time in, you know, frat houses and things like that as opposed to being able to hang out with sketchy counties in, in dive bars instead. Um, so, and I did not really change my major unless you count studying chemical engineering in grad school in chemistry and undergrad, I kind of switched a little bit. But for the most part, I didn't change my major just because I was condes or pretentious and uh, stubborn and wanted to say, well, no, chemistry is better than everything else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna study chemistry because I'm smarter than everybody else. Um, I've since learned that's not the case. But that was kind of my logic for not changing my major sometimes when maybe it would have been a better idea to change my major um, or not change my major. Turns out chemical engineering is not the same as chemistry. Um, and we don't have all the same courses, which I thought, ah, how different can it be? Again, showing uh, how little I knew, but I thought I understood everything. Um, this one I threw on the personal section just because I wanted to answer this question because this is an ongoing field of research about having. 
about um, screens and sleep. It's just good advice in terms of um, the sort of sleep hygiene, like getting good productive sleep. Um, it's not so much having your phone next to you necessarily, it's an issue, but I think a lot of the research has been, you know, probably a lot of you've heard about blue light being an issue. Um, and it's still ongoing field of research. We don't understand it completely, but one of the things we do understand is that when you see blue light or high energy photons hit, it, hit your retina, your body starts automatically breaking down melatonin, which is one of the hormones that your body use, uses to make you feel tired when it's time to sleep. So if you're constantly exposing yourself to blue light, you're not as likely to fall asleep. And the sleep that you do get won't be as deep because your body doesn't have that higher level of melatonin it's supposed to have at a certain time of the, of the day. Um, on the flip side is that means that actually browsing your phone when you hit snooze on your alarm clock actually is productive in terms of helping you wake up because getting that blue light first thing in the morning starts helping you wake up and break down those uh, that residual melatonin and things like that. Um, it's just a really interesting field of research that's going on right now that really shows how neurology and chemistry and biochemistry um, all kind of interact together. And it, it's cool because it's being researched right now. We're learning more and more about that. Um, which brings me to what's the best advice I can give to a science major? If you're, if you're required to take a science class in your science major, odds are it's for a reason. It's not just there, it's a barrier. So I know it's really, really tempting to think of certain classes as being, man, I just have to get through this. I really, I don't understand why I have to take this, you know, this biology class. I wish I didn't have to. It's just draining my energy for no reason. It's there for a reason. And, and probably one of the most helpful things I can, um, if I can try and convince you to think of classes like that in terms of, well, I'm gonna try and find what it is about this class that does apply that I'm interested in, or why is this required class? Because usually it's not a gatekeeping thing. The old school way of doing things is there definitely were gatekeeping classes. You had to take it even though it wasn't applicable just so they could weed people out. Um, they don't do that typically anymore. If you're required to take a class, try and figure out why. Um, and you'll get more out of the class. Your instructor will appreciate you more um, because you won't ask questions like, is this going to be on the test? Or how is this going to affect my grade? Or I don't really care about the material. All I need, want to do is get an A. Those are all things you should never say to an instructor, even if it's true, because it just, you know, it, it emphasizes in their mind that you're not really there for the material. You don't really care about the thing the instructor cares so much about that they've dedicated their life to teaching. So it's just not a, Rude might not be the right word, but it's definitely not a good idea to say things like that. And if you can actually, beyond just not saying it, not think it too, do the best you can to actually appreciate the material, that'll take you a long way in terms of um, both what, how enthusiastic you are about a class, which in turn will affect how motivated you are to study and show up as well. Um, the one that I remember was I had to take, I, Got a, I took the AP test in high school for Gen Chem. And so I, but I still had to take it as a chem major, even though I've got a final on the AP test. And that would really bother me as an 18 year old. Why do I have to get up early and go to this class that I've already got a final on the AP test for? Um, and I didn't show up to class very often, not really as often as I should. I could have learned that stuff a lot better, having seen it a second time more in depth. Um, had I not had that, that entitled I don't need to be here attitude. So the more you can avoid that, the better. I can realize it's not possible to always avoid that, but um, as much as you can. On that, through my answers to uh, to the quiz questions from music and movies and books, a lot of you asked me about what, what would you put on there? So I put some links to some of my favorite music right now. Um, and if you're, if you're into hip hop and not into country, um, you should listen to, there's a, there's a live version of Post Malone covering Spiritual Simpson song. So it's a very, very like, classic country sounding, sounds like, like Hank Jr. Um, it's the original song, but it's Post Malone doing a version of it. Um, that's, that's pretty entertaining. Um, if you're not into country, I recommend 
A good way to get into country is to watch some of their covers of songs that you do know or other artists that you do know covering country songs. It's kind of fun. Um, Sergio Simpson's cover of uh, Nirvana in Bloom is really, really good too. Um, and then uh, Black and Blue, this is this band is super awesome. Uh, it's this, this guy who, who, uh, who got challenged on a 4 chain board in, uh, in the early 2000s or 2010s to, um, to combine um, slave gospel music with black metal. And he took that and went with it. And so it's very like Delta blues meets, meets black metal. Um, very, very fun stuff. If you're into either of those genres, I highly recommend checking it out. All right. And then I like a lot of sci fi. Um, you couldn't guess that. Most science instructors like sci fi, but uh, Interstellar and Annihilation are both really good. Um, I still haven't seen the new Dune movie. I think it just went, I'm just going to wait till the next one comes out. Um, so I can do it all at once, like as, as uh, Herbert intended. Um, and then as far as reading, this guy, Kim Stanley Robinson, writes the best sci fi I think I've ever read. He does a really, really good job talking about the science. Red Mars is all about what an actual colonial mission or colonizing mission to Mars would look like. Um, of course, it was written in the, in the late 80s, um, but he still, it does, still doesn't actually feel that dated, oddly enough, despite how much technology has changed. He actually predicted a lot of how technology has changed um, in this early book. Um, so it's, it's a pretty entertaining read. Um, and then just other fiction stuff. I, I read a lot of fiction, I'm all over the board. All right, course questions, stuff that actually is relevant to you. Um, what do we do to need to do to see? Well, if you're here, you're already doing the most important thing, which is to show up. Um, the uh, showing up, turning in the assignments on time as much as possible um, are, is the number one indicator of success. And of course, it's literally just being here. Um, there's a lot of, of other benefits that come along with just being present and just getting stuff turned in on time as much as possible. Um, what's the most difficult topic? The way that the course is broken up, the, the most important topic in each of the three quarters, we can kind of break it down into the most important topic for this quarter is strike geometry, um, which if you had a chemistry class before, you probably heard that word. Um, we're going to approach it in, uh, in a more in-depth way than Chem 100 to do a lot of writing algebra expressions to do stoic geometry as opposed to just using it as a conversion. Um, but it's a pretty pretty important topic. Um, second quarter is going to be equilibrium, which is more algebra but set up differently. And it has to do with the fact that no chemical reaction actually goes to completion. So you learn about stoic geometry and theoretical yield, which is all about predicting how much you could make. And then the next thing you learn is yeah, but none of those reactions actually go 100% to completion. So we need to adjust what we just learned last quarter. And then the third quarter, the most important topic is rates and kinetics, which is how fast do you get to equilibrium? How fast do the reactions happen? Um, so those are going to be the biggest topics in each of the categories. And when we get to stoic geometry, we'll spend some time there. Um, Tutoring, we're still setting the hours, but I believe it's going to be Tuesdays and Thursdays after this class. Um, there's going to be some, not only do you have my office hours that you can come to talk, um, uh, Hannah will be down in the library as well, in the tutoring center, doing, um, giving help with, uh, with chemistry as well. And so if we add more hours, I'll keep you updated as well. Um, and I actually heard this not once, but twice, in different forms. Um, I'm not good at chemistry. Can I still pass this class? Absolutely. You may be not, not good at chemistry yet um, because you had a bad experience in high school or because somebody convinced you at some point you're not good at math. Um, none of those things have to stay true and you can still do just fine. If you never had high school chemistry, you can still come into this class. Or if you didn't take Chem 100, you can still come into this class and do okay. You might feel a little bit lost at point. Well, no matter where you're coming from, you're going to feel a little bit lost at points in this class. Um, but it's nothing you can't come back from if you're willing to put in the work and show up. All right, so just keep doing that. Put in the work, show up, and you'll be okay. Um, if there's ever extenuating circumstances, like you get COVID in week two and are gone for three weeks to recover, and then 
like you're so far behind, come talk to me before you just drop your class because the odds are there's something we can work out. Maybe the best option is to withdraw and, and take it next year, and that's just bad luck. Um, but there's probably a way that we can keep you on track um, as much as possible. Um, so just talk to me about it before you just fail. Um, that's my my number one, I won't call it a pet peeve, but a like missed opportunity is people that are sitting like with a solid low B, but they think they're so far behind, they'll never be able to catch up. And so they might as well just drop and put them off a whole year or they change their major and never see them again. Don't do that. Talk to me about it before you drop. And I might recommend, hey, maybe this year it's not going to work. Maybe we can work on it more next year. Take more math and we'll be more better prepared. That kind of thing. But at least let me talk to you. Any questions about the course stuff before we get into uh, review and practice? Yeah. I have an unrelated question. Okay. Well, I may tell you to hold on to that, but go ahead. If I have a car battery and I'm connecting it to, let's say, a medical battery and a six amps, when the amps build up, so would you have 70 amps on top of six amps and then so going in total? That's a better question for Bruce because uh, he's taken circuits a lot more recently. Bruce Brandt or Bruce? Sorry, actually, probably either of them, frankly. Uh, Bruce Brandt is one of the math adjuncts. Bruce Armburst is one of the math full timers. Um, Bruce Brandt's day job before he started teaching for us was actually planning, planning missions with NASA and JPL um, and designing, like, and doing some of the programming as well as actually planning out how the um, missions in space work, which is a really, really fun like logic puzzle when you actually have to plan some of these things. If you think about the scenes in Apollo 13. Has anybody seen Apollo 13? It's really old. Movie, but, um, but if you haven't seen it, watch it. But there's a scene where they just like dump a bunch of stuff on the, on the table. It's like, this is the stuff we have to work for. How can we accomplish this goal? Um, and it's because there is no way to get extra resources once you're in space, right? You got to make do with what's already there. So, it's, but that was what Bruce Brandt actually did. Um, I think he worked for Boeing, if I'm not mistaken, up in Seattle. Um, but you could ask him about it and get more help. But Bruce Brandt or Bruce Roberts, either one of them should probably answer that question better than me. All right. So let's practice with sig figs before we get into conversions. So a reminder that with sig figs for addition and subtraction, which is the same, the same operation really, right? A subtraction is just adding a negative number. So for addition and subtraction, keep the same uncertainty as your least certain number. And for multiplication and division, you keep the same, what? Sig figs, same number of sig figs as the number that has the fewest sig figs. So as long as you have that written in front of you, it's not so hard to learn how to, to do the rounding, right? So let's practice it. What do we get? First off, for each of these, what I'll do is get a calculator answer and then we'll figure out where we need to round it collectively. So our calculator answer here, we get what, nine, 9.83? No, that's not what I want. My there it is. And still write your units so we can practice our units. What do we have to do for sig figs? Anything? We're good here, right? When you're adding two numbers that are measured from the same with the same device, they probably already have the same uncertainty. So in this case, we don't need to do any rounding. We're good. We have 6.0 gallons minus 0 0.08 gallons. What's our calculator answer? 5.92. 5.92 what? 
Gallons. And what do we need to do for rounding? We have plus or minus 100, and we have plus or minus a tenth. So our answer could be off by a tenth. So we need to round to the tenths place. So 5.9 gallons. All right. Three point one oh one minus point one two meters. Get what's our calculator answer? Nine eight nine one. So, what do we need to do? And meters. Where are we rounding it to? What place? To the we have plus or minus a hundred or plus or minus a thousand. So it can be plus or minus 10 or sorry, a hundred. So 2.98 meters. 12 minutes plus 0.19 minutes. Calculator answer is going to be 12.19, right? minutes plus or minus a minute on the 12 and we're plus or minus 0 0.01 minutes so our answer could be off by an entire minute still right so not even 12.2 it's just 12. we have to round to the nearest one because that's where our, our uncertainty is. And to make sense of this, think about if you filled up a five gallon bucket and then you dumped it into, I don't know, a fish tank. And then you took a teaspoon of water and you added it to the fish tank. Did the volume of the fish tank measurably change? Not really, right? If we were really careful, if we had a big scale out and we made it before and after, we might be able to tell the difference. But if our uncertainty was in filling up that five gallon bucket, then it doesn't really matter that we put a teaspoon in. We could already be off by more than that. Right? The other example is our friend in Placerville who's calling to let us know to stop at the stoplight. He's going to be 15 seconds late. Cool. Good for you. See you when you get here. All right. So, any questions on? Addition and subtraction. Good. And in my mind, multiplication and division was even easier because we don't even have to think about the uncertainty. We just count safe base. So let's do the same thing. Get a calculator answer, we'll write it up, and then we'll go through the rounding. Chris? So, a uh, question about uh, safe base. I was in biology earlier. And the teacher was mentioning some like general rules for counting significant uh, figures. So, like leading zeros and trailing zeros don't count. So, that, like, we would, uh, for, for that, we would count 507 and it's three or. Sorry, I added one on there. Make four about zero. So, that would be four significant figures. Correct. So leading zeros are anything that's to the left of your first non-zero number. So it can be in front of the decimal point or behind the decimal point, but if it's to the left of your first non-zero number, your first measure number, then it doesn't count as a sig fig. So not a sig fig, not a sig fig. If it's a non-zero number, it's always a sig fig. So zeros are the only place where we run into issues with sig figs. Anything non-zero is always a sig fig. So, yes, yes. If it's between, and these, these rules are more explicitly laid out in the slide deck from last week. I kind of skipped over it um, a little bit in the interest of time. If it's a zero that's in between two other measured numbers, that means you had to measure the zero as well, right? So that's also a sig fig. And if it's at the very end, the only reason to write that zero there, we don't need that zero to tell us where to put the decimal point or anything, right? 
the only reason to write a zero at the very end, the trailing zero, is in order to show that it's a sig fig. Right? So this number, and I just will I'll erase all that circling I just did, since it just makes it look more complicated. <laughs> This number has four significant figures. It has four numbers that were measured. That leading zero and that leading zero do not count. Right? And that's the number one thing is that people where people get mis, uh, messed up on this is they think of a leading zero means in front of the decimal point. It's in front of any non-zero number. So it can still be behind the decimal point and still be a leading zero. And so that's not a safe thing. And again, if you get messed up on that, if you get mixed up and, and do that wrong, I'll just gently remind you um, and we'll get better and better at it to the point where you're not even thinking about it. Wouldn't that be nice to not have to be thinking about sick face all the time? All right, so let's get some calculator answers here. What is for this first one? 12.1 times 3.4 times 187.4 feet. Got 7,709. 7,709.636. What do we do with the units on this? Be cubed. So the, if you're unsure what to do with units when you do math, they follow the same rules actually as variables in algebra. If you had 3x times 4x times 5x, you're going to wind up with x cubed at the end, right? But if you have 3x plus 4x plus 5x, you do the addition and it's still all just x at the end, right? Same with units. So in this case, we get feet cubed. And how many sig figs do we get to keep? Two. Just two, right? That 3.4 is our smallest number of sig figs. So we get 7,700 feet plus or minus 100 feet cubed, which we have a better way of writing that, right? So we put it in scientific notation. 7.7 .7 times 10 to the third feet cubed. Right. If you when you write down, if you write down all the sig figs that you need to keep in your scientific notation, then that automatically tells the reader, okay, it's plus or minus one in this spot. Which is the same thing we were saying it by explicitly writing it out up here. It's not wrong to explicitly write it out. It just winds up being a lot of extra work when you start getting really big numbers, right? You don't want to have to write 17 billion plus or minus 100 million, like with taking a lot of space on your page, a lot of your time. Definitely, once we get past the thousands, it's pretty much always easier to write it in scientific notation. What do we get here? Something around 5,000? 5,529.6 centimeters, what? Square. Squared. Two powers of centimeters, so centimeters squared. And how many sig figs do we get to keep? Two. Just two. So we get 5,500. plus or minus 100, if we're writing it all the way out. And it's okay to do this as showing your work if you're still getting used to how to do rounding and putting it in scientific notation. You can, you can show it like this or do something like, you know, if I was just showing my work for myself, um, not to be graded on it necessarily, you could even do something like, okay, that's my last sick thing that I'm keeping. And now I can put it in scientific notation that reminds me 
um, where I'm supposed to stop writing numbers on my scientific notation. All right, so 5.5 .5 times 10 to the third centimeters squared. All right. <clears throat> Questions on these first two? Cool. How about here? I can do this math in my head. You can too, right? 102.1 divided by 10 even is going to be 10.21. What do we do with units? Meters over seconds. Just like if it was 10 watt, 10 X divided by two Y, you can combine those coefficients. You can simplify the coefficients to make that five, right? But you can't do anything with X over Y. So you're left with X over Y. So we're left with meters over seconds. And how many sig figs are we keeping? Three. Ten point zero is three sig figs. Hundred and two point one is four sig figs. So we're going to keep three. So ten point two meters per second. And one hundred and seventy five pounds divided by one hundred and ninety two point four pounds. Okay, I'm just going to leave it like that because that's definitely more than we need, right? So in some cases, I'm not even going to, especially when division is involved, right? That's when you get the really long repeating decimals. You never want to write the whole of them out. Um, so write out as many as you need to so you know it's definitely more than what you're going to keep. And then You've got 175 pounds versus 192.4, three sig figs versus four sig figs, right? So we're keeping three sig figs. So 0 0.910. Zero. Don't forget to write that last zero. Yeah, we rounded it up, and that zero is not going to count mathematically anymore, but we still need to indicate that it's a sig fig. What happened to the units on this one? Yeah, so this, this number doesn't really mean anything anymore without more context. If I changed this up, if I added more details, if I said this was um, pounds of water per, and this was pounds of, I don't know, watermelon. Now, all of a sudden, we can say, oh, well, this is, this is the ratio of water to the weight of the entire watermelon, right? But without more context, sometimes the units will cancel out, and you're left with a ratio that's meaningless unless you give it context, which in this case, without knowing more about what these pounds are, it doesn't really do any things. You just kind of have to think about it as a ratio. Um, this be, that's the one case when we actually do wind up with unitless numbers in the sciences is when it's a ratio of two similar units. All right, any other questions on this? Yeah. So that's that is one way to do it. That's the the thinking behind this was um, originally that. If you get a five right here, well, that's square in the middle between rounding up and rounding down, right? So the thinking in older engineering um, schools, especially was you should round to the even number because I mean, it's half the time you round up and half the time you round down. Um, and so in theory, that should make it a little bit more random and, and normal. But the thing is, is that thinking about five as being square in the middle, isn't really accurate because that neglects zero as a possibility, right? So five is actually, if you start, if you think about your ten, your this place is starting in at zero, zero, one, two, three, and four, 
all round down. Five, six, seven, eight, and nine all round up. So you have five digits that round up and five digits that round down. Um, so it's not really a, a rounding method that we use anymore. Um, we understand the math and the statistics better now. Um, that, so we just five rounds up always. Um, if you've already been trained very, very well on the round to the even number, I'm not going to take off points typically. Um, but it's a better idea to just get into the more standard math way of rounding. It's one of those things that the engineers went off and made a decision without talking to the scientists or the mathematicians as much, because mathematicians never even bothered to specify because they think in terms of number lines already made sense for five rounds up. Um, and so it just sort of took hold for a couple of decades, and that's how I was first taught. When, uh, but that's not the way we teach it anymore. All right, what do we do when we have to do both operations? When we have an addition, subtraction, and multiplication, division mixed together. So it's easy enough when it's just multiplication or just addition, subtraction. So let's start by. Doing this, Let, let's say we have a room, um, and I could have, I should, if I had time, I would have updated this because this is the, was going to be the shape of the room I used to teach in here. 16.0 um, feet times 32.5 feet. You want to know what the area of this room is, which is length times weight, right? So, what's our answer with proper sig figs? 520. So, and how many sig figs are we going to keep? Three. Three sig figs. They're both three sig figs, right? Mm -hmm. So, 520 is that round to three sig figs? Is that plus or minus one? We could do that then. And our units are now square feet. Our uncertainty is plus or minus a foot, right? Let's say that a bulkhead is installed that's six feet by one and a half feet that takes up some room. We could use our pillar in the middle as a standard about the same sort of question. If we're going to measure this, how many square feet are lost when they install that bulkhead? Still just length times width, right? What's the length times width for the bulkhead? 9.3. Yeah, it's just six times 1.55, right? So 9.3. And how many sig figs are we going to keep? Three sig figs. So 9.30 squared. feet squared. Good. What's the green area now? You subtract it to, right? So 520 feet squared minus nah, 9.30 feet squared we have 510.70 feet squared. And now where are we rounding? We have to go back to keep the same uncertainty, right? So this number 520 was plus or minus a foot. So it means our answer has to be plus or minus a foot. So 511. When you switch operations, you have to have the right rounding done before you go to the next operation or it throws everything off. It gets if you're just if you're doing a bunch of math and it's all multiplication and division, you can wait and you can do your rounding at the very end. If you're doing a bunch of uh, addition and subtraction, you can wait and do all your rounding at the very end. But when you switch between those operations, you have to do your rounding in the middle. Right? You have to get your these sig figs right before you can do your subtraction and get that number right. Right, so this is by far the, the hardest 
part of knowing where to round is, well, one, keeping these straight, not mixing these up. And then two, knowing that you have to stop in the middle. It's not a tricky calculation, right? You can plug, you can plug this into your TID3 all in one, one step and get an answer at the end, right? But where would you round? You don't know where you need to round unless you stop in the middle when you switch operations. So parentheses throw this off because parentheses can put addition and subtraction first, the form multiplication division, or if you're gonna find a ratio and then subtract something from it, that can throw this off, right? So sometimes it seems like you're gonna wind up over rounding that there's so many times that you're rounding, you could actually find it significantly changing your number, but in general, you know, randomness would suggest that you're gonna round up the same number of times that you're gonna round down on average. So usually you're gonna wind up with the same answer at the end, but you're gonna know what the right signals are. And if you do wind up getting a different number at the end versus rounding in the middle versus at the very end, it's probably only gonna be off by one sig big because that's where the uncertainty is anyway. That's why these rules are the way that they are is so that if you round it in a different order, you should still get within the same uncertainty. There are exceptions, there are random cases, number, you know, combinations of numbers where you wind up rounding three times and you round it up every time. They wind up changing it maybe measurably, but that's still following the rules for rounding, so it's still the right way to do it. And if it's a significant amount, then you need to get better numbers where you don't have to round it as much. And that should take care of it too. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's talk about conversions real quick once, and then we're going to take our break in, in 10 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and get lots of practice converting units. And your ICA this week, which is tomorrow or Thursday, um, is a chance to finish up, look right up to the lab this week, and a sheet of conversion problems where you're just going to practice, um, run through them so you can't get it wrong. Because conversion plays the basis for stoichiometry, and stoichiometry is the biggest topic of this quarter, right? So don't just try to get through conversions until we get past it to the next step, because it's going to keep coming back. All right, so the basics of, of conver conversions are when we can say that two things are equal to each other, that allows us to do some um some math with it some arithmetic basically and so we anytime we can say that one quantity is equal to another quantity then we're writing what's called an equality which makes sense right we're saying two things are equal so what's here's an example one that we should probably all know one meter is equal to 100 centimeters that's an equality and, but it doesn't have to be something where it's, you know, talking about units. And literally, any time you can say two things are equal, you can write it as an equality, which means you can do math with it. So 12 inches equals a foot. We could write equalities for length, you know, more equalities for length, like meters to kilometers or feet to miles or miles to um, miles to what's another what's a good one? Before you get to like light years, um, there are lots of different length units you could use. A league, I believe, a league is six miles, twenty miles. Are you, yeah, there's all sorts of weird length units out there. Fathom, fathom is an old nautical unit that they would say they would measure the sea floor and say it's twelve fathoms deep here. Um, and fathom is six feet. There's all sorts of weird units out there, but anytime we can say two things are equal, we can write it like this. So one fathom equals six feet. We can do the same thing for volume or time or mass. Um, and somebody, somebody on the quiz asked me about time units and why, you know, do we have better units for time? How better definition of what a second is? Um, compared to just doing it, you know, astronomically. Um, 
you know, because a second on Mars should be the same as a second on Earth, even though a year distance around the sun is not the same for both of them, right? Um, so they've actually redefined a second to be the amount of time that it takes in cesium-127 to decay X number of times. Um, so basically they redefined a second in terms of the half-life of a, of a uh, radioactive isotope because that should be universal, not having anything to do with um, our particular position in the solar system. But that's an equality right there. One second equals this many, this many nuclear reactions of cesium-127. That's an, e that's an equality. Maddie? Why does that mean? Longer ago than you might think. Um, I think that they, I want to say in the late 80s maybe, is basically it's, it's the same, same principle that they used to make you ever heard the phrase of atomic clocks are the most accurate clocks that you can have. Um, they they are work by having a radioactive isotope and then every X number of times it decays, it causes a second, the second hand to move one spot. Um, so there are, I, I wanna say it was probably late 80s, um, probably right around the same time that they tried to get the US educational system to adopt a metric system, um, which they did officially, it's just nobody actually used it. Um, so technically we officially use meters in the US, but none of you can visualize what a meter is because none of your teachers in high school could visualize what a meter was. It's a vicious circle. Um, anyway, what about mass? What could we say? What kind of equalities could we write with mass? Kilogram equals what? A thousand grams. Um, you could say something like one pound equals 453.59 grams. If you have that one memorized or your conversion sheet in front of you. Um, you could even do other weird conversions like, or um, equalities like one gram of fat equals seven kilocalories. And you can write nutritional equalities where you're saying this much this of this food has this much um, fat in it or this much calories in it or this many um, this many grams of potassium, etc. Right. So anything, literally any time you can say two things are equal to each other, it's an equality. And if we rearrange the equality, if we, we have an equality, this is now a mathematical equation, right? It's just a mathematical equation that has units on it, which means we can do algebra with it. So we could do something like divide both sides by 12 inches. What's left on the left-hand side after we do that? Not even one inch, just one. It doesn't even have units once you do that, right? So you get one foot divided by 12 inches equals one. Cool trick, right? What good is it? People still watch Zoom. I'm getting to the point now where I'm, I'm out of touch and I'm still wondering um, if any of my old references still hold up. If I said cool story, possible, you know, people get that a little bit. Zoolander, you haven't watched Zoolander, one of the best in the 90s comedies, early 2000s. So when we rearrange it, we call it a conversion factor, then basically all it is is the ratio that's equal to one. And if you have a ratio equal to one, we can do anything we want with it. We can take any other number in the universe and multiply it by that ratio and not change the number we started with, right? So all we did was multiply by one. It's just one that looks fancier than normal. So if we can always multiply by one without changing the original amount, we can take any number we want and multiply it by a conversion factor and we didn't change anything. But the units can cancel out now to make it look like, to make it look different. That's all conversions are. The whole idea is we're not changing anything because if you convert your units properly, you should have the same thing that you started with at the end. It doesn't really change the length of this table if I measure it in meters versus feet, right? But I'm just going to write it down differently with different numbers. That's all a conversion is. And 
So the key is we need to make sure we have the same units on top and bottom when we're converting. That's what's going to allow us to cancel things out. So for instance, if we have 0.571 meters and we want to know how many centimeters that is, a lot of you could probably do that in your head if you've worked with centimeters at all. But if we want to show our work, which is a good habit to be in, all we're going to do is take that 0.571 meters and we're going to multiply it by a conversion factor that has meters on the bottom. Because remember, this is 0.571 meters is over one, right? So we're just multiplying fractions. Everything is over one always, if there, unless there's something else explicitly stated. So we just multiply across and we wind up with meters on top and meters on bottom. We have meters on top and meters on bottom. They cancel out, just like having X over X. And which means our new units are what are left over. All right, so all there is to conversions is pick a conversion factor that lets you cancel out the unit you start with. And then try and get closer to the unit you're trying to get to. In this case, it's one step. All it takes is one conversion. We're in centimeters. The net result is we're just multiplying by 100. But sometimes we're going to have conversions that take more than one step or where it's not entirely obvious right off the bat what to do. Everybody in here who grew up with feet as the you know, default unit of measurement knows how to go from feet to inches, right? How do you go from feet to inches? But what would you plug into your goggle there? Times 12, right? If I say that this table is six feet long and I want to know how many inches that is, multiply by 12. If you're not sure, the problem with just doing it intuitively like that it means that sometimes you multiply by 12 where you're supposed to divide by 12. It also means it's when we get to examples where you don't have any built-in intuition for those units, you wind up getting things backwards, multiplying by 100 where you were supposed to divide by 100. So we always want to show the conversion factor, even for really simple ones. Like the simplest conversion that we have in this class um, comes from centimeters cubed and milliliters. So a thousand milliliters is equal to a thousand cubic centimeters. So we could simplify that, right? If we divided both sides by a thousand, what do we get? One milliliter equals one cubic centimeter, right? So if we had something like, um, I don't know, We'll use the same number, even 57.1 milliliters. But your lab report says we need you to report this number, this volume in cubic centimeters. Well, then technically, the way to, to show all of your work is to write out one milliliter equals one cubic centimeter. Mathematically, it does absolutely nothing, right? You're multiplying y1 and then dividing by one. But it allows the units to cancel out. We're left in just 57.1 cubic centimeters. That is about the only conversion that I don't want you to write out as a conversion in this class. I will let you do that one in your head. The rest of them, centimeters to meters, meters to kilometers, grams, kilograms. Even if it's something really simple that you've done a dozen times, I want you to show that conversion factor for it, right? Because I really, really don't like taking away points to, when people convert from centimeters, from meters to centimeters, um, because they divided by 100 when they were supposed to multiply by 100. You guys all know 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. But if you don't show this, roughly 10% of you will divide by 100 when you're supposed to multiply by 100. It's just been my experience. I don't know this group that well yet, but. In the past, I could make that statement about my students. Y'all are going to be better than that, though, because you're going to show your work. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after, and we'll keep practicing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I'm telling you, give me the right bed elements as your source. Parts of PT, but if there's a part of it, it's a part of it. All right, everybody, as we bring it back here. All right, so here's another one that probably we already talked about a few inches a little bit. But if you are going to show your work, we went up 5.33 feet, and we want to turn that into inches. How would we show our work for that? Or would it be if you want to put like 5.33 feet? And then on the next one, we would put a foot feet in front. And then just multiply across, right? Feet cancels feet. You're left in inches. So multiplying across is feet. If you wind up with a number on the bottom, then that just means you're dividing by that number, right? So 5.33 feet, feet cancels out. We just get 5.33 times 12. Equals what's a calculator answer? 63.96. 63 inches. What do we do for six days? So we have two six big, so I'm sorry, we have three six things on our initial measurement. Is this two sig figs? It looks like two sig figs, but what do we know about 12 inches in one foot? It's not a measured number. Right term, it's an exact number. It's not about 12 inches equals one foot, right? That's the definition of a foot is 12 inches exactly. Not 12.01, not 11.99. It's exactly 12 inches equals one foot. So if it's an exact number, that means it has infinite sig figs. It's not just 12 inches equals one, but it's 12.000 out to infinity. So with that in mind, it has infinite sig figs. An exact conversion has infinite sig figs, which means it's never gonna be what limits us. So our 5.33 at the beginning is gonna be what limits our number of sig figs at the end. So it would just be, 64.0. Six means we have to round up, which means this becomes a 10, which means a 64.0. Right, so for the most part, most of the conversions on your conversion sheet are exact. Like the ones that aren't, I guess that there's one main rule, and it describes this at the top, where it says all conversions within the same system are exact, and all conversions between systems are approximate. And by the way, systems, I mean metric to imperial means. So anything that's feet to miles, that's exact. Inches to feet, that's exact. Centimeters to meters, that's exact. Meters or kilometers to miles is approximate. That's in between systems, across systems. So to go from metric system to the imperial system, there's only one exact conversion, and that's centimeters to inches. So if we wanted to use only exact conversions, if we had a whole bunch of sig figs we wanted to keep, we would have to go all the way to inches or centimeters, and then you can switch to the other unit. For the most part, it's not usually going to make a difference. If you look at this sheet, there's a conversion for miles to kilometers, it's got four sig figs. One mile is approximately 1.609 kilometers. 
That's good enough for most cases. Because very rarely are we gonna have something with, with more than four sig figs and need to convert from miles to kilometers. But if we did, we would want to use only the exact conversions. All right, because you guys have experienced now in lab that getting more sig figs can be a lot of work, right? Um, you know, the reason we didn't just dump those metal shards into a graduated cylinder, why we used that volume by displacement method with the lid was so that we could have more sig figs by measuring the mass instead of just measuring the voltages on the graduated cylinder. So if we go to all that trouble to get more sig figs on our numbers, don't be lazy in the conversions and you have to round off those sig figs we worked so hard to get. Right, so you never want your conversions, your choice of conversions, to be what limits your number of sig figs. Um, and I, this is one where there's a few problems on the final or on the midterm at least um, that I will I will straight up tell you. It's going to be some variation of this where I give you some, a length with five sig figs and have you go from say kilometers to feet. And if you have five sig figs, let's, let's just do one. Let's say we have um, I don't know, nine point, as we haven't done multiple step conversions yet. We'll start with an easier one and then we'll come back to this. And remember, if you don't cancel out your units, you're gonna have a bad time. You're gonna wind up with something that doesn't make sense at the end. Like um, you're gonna wind up with feet squared over inches as your final unit. If you do that, that means you set up your conversion wrong. You multiply by 12, but you're supposed to divide by 12 or vice versa. And so the way to avoid that is to cancel out your units. And then you'll have a good time. We like conversions when everything works out nicely, at least I did. Um, I still like conversions because everything, everything works. Go follow one old me or an older me. If you want to go inches to miles, now we're starting to get into the realm where you might not know how to just plug it into your calculator without thinking about it. Is there a conversion on your conversion sheet that goes that compares inches to miles directly? But what is there? Miles to feet, miles to feet and feet to inches. So if we need to do, if we don't have one conversion that gets us all the way where we need to go, do it in two conversions. So if we set up, was it five point? I just. Okay. Thank you. And we want to put that in miles. So we can't go inches to miles, but we can go inches to feet and feet to miles. So we can either set it up as two conversions in a row, or there's nothing to stop us from multiplying by, by one two times in the same line, right? So we could do 5.33 times 10 to the six inches and 12 inches is one foot. We could hit enter and get an answer, right? Be something in the 10 to the fifth range. Four times 10 to the fifth, maybe. So let's get an answer. And how many sig figs are we gonna keep? Three. What is it? Sorry, give me this one first. Just so we can write it up there. 5.33, 10 to the six, divided by 12, something times 10 to the five feet. Did anybody plug it in? I got 443,000. Four forty four, and then if I keep in three sig figs, is it four forty four or four forty five? Okay, four point four four times ten to the five p. Because this is five million, and I'm dividing by twelve, which for the purposes of estimating my head, twelve is really close to ten, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that the answer here is going to be really close to dividing this by ten. And five million divided by ten is, is going to be close to five hundred thousand. 
So in five hundred and a hundred thousand is ten to the fifth. Yeah, so this that's just the way that when you get used to thinking in scientific notation, okay, if I'm dividing by 100, I know that this is the power is going to shift by two. Okay. Or if I'm multiplying by a thousand, that's the same as shifting this by 10 to the three. Right, so it's, it's just one of those mental shortcuts once you get used to it. But if you just plugged in your calculator and got an answer, that's totally fine too. If we wanted to then take this number, times 10 to the five feet, and we wanted to put that in miles. We have a conversion that goes feet to miles, right? If you don't have it memorized, it's on your conversion sheet. It's 5,280 feet is one mile. Eighty-four point one. So we can't do both calculations. Right you can. I'm just working it out to show how it works this way first, and then I'll. I usually will write them out at the same time. All right. So this gives us our answer. It's two steps. You have to stop in the middle to write your answer down, though. The other way to do it is there's no. This conversion is also equal to one, right? That's what makes it a conversion factor. So there's no reason why we can't do both of them in a row to cancel out the units. So instead of stopping there, I canceled out inches, right? Now I want to cancel out feet. So same thing, 5,280 feet. Still works the same way. Still, feet is still going to cancel out feet, and you're left in miles. And mathematically, does the same thing too, right? You start. You, the first step was divide by twelve, and then and divide by five thousand two hundred eighty. We're still doing that. We're just writing it all in one line. So, if doing them consecutively like this on the same line is tricky for you, that's fine. You can do it in multiple steps. You can hit enter at any point that's convenient. Or if you're gonna start doing some where we do seven conversions in a row, and after five conversions, um, you run out of space on the line on your paper. So it might be convenient to just hit equals, grab a number, and then do the last two steps on the next line. Or you could stop after every conversion and write down your answer. You will get to the same place as long as you make sure your units cancel out. And the rounding be a little different. You should still wind up with the same state. So you might wind up with 84.2 instead of 84.1 if you did it, if you stopped to round in the middle. But in general, it should average out to being within the way that I described it is within sig face. Within sig face means that it's that your number is only off by in the last digit by a little bit. Right, it's within the uncertainty for that number anyway. So anytime I see that if somebody wrote 84.2 miles, that's a full credit into two. And I don't know where they rounded to get that, but I know that they got to the right place eventually. It just looks a little different than mine. If somebody writes 84.7 miles, you're off by that much, I might try to hunt down where they did their rounding to see what happened to get it that far off from what my number was. But I'm still probably going to be pretty generous with that. That's still really close to the right answer. You know, it's more than what we would normally think of as the uncertainty. All right. So if you have a conversion that requires multiple steps, Sometimes it's helpful to plan it out instead of just starting of writing numbers and plugging stuff into your calculator. Even if you don't know what the conversion is, you might start by saying, well, I know I can go inches to feet, and I know that I can go feet to miles, just so you have a kind of a, a game plan. And then you can go and actually find those conversions and what they are, right? So especially for the ones that you don't have memorized, it's really helpful sometimes to have sort of a roadmap guide you. Prefixes. Prefixes 
this is kind of a small list of conversions, all things considered, right? There's a lot of different units that we're going to deal with in this class. And you might notice that there's nothing in length that has anything to do with centimeters. Oh, I guess you've got centimeters to inches, but you don't have centimeters to meters or millimeters to meters or kilometers, right? That's because all of the, the metric prefixes, what they call the SI unit prefixes, um, can be applied to any unit. It's just a way of, it's a prefix, meaning you just throw it in front of the existing unit and it modifies it. So centi anything is a hundred times smaller than, than the original. You can have a centi inch, would be a hundred, a hundred centi inches is one inch, just the same way that a hundred centimeters is one meter. So any of these work in there, this is, these are all the big ones. There's some other small ones, for instance, deca is not on there. Deca means is 10 times bigger than what you started with, but it shows up a lot less frequently. Um, and for the most part, other than centi and deci, they're all in powers of 10 to the three, which means it's easy to kind of remember how they work. It's always dealing in thousands or millions or trillions, et cetera, um, because that's the way that our, our counting system works, right? We, every three digits, three places, we put a comma. Every place that you would put a comma, it's a spot that you could use a prefix more or less. So kilo is 10 to the three, milli is 10 to the minus three. What that means, it's, and it can be a little bit tricky when you see them presented like this. And the reason that I didn't explicitly write this out in more detail is because this is the way it shows up on standardized tests. Sometimes if you have to take a standardized test like the MCAT, um, they will give you a list of these prefixes, but it looks like this. It doesn't have a lot of details of how to use it. You have to know how to use it. Um, it doesn't hold your hand that way. So the way that I always keep it straight is some of these make things bigger and some of things, some of these make things smaller. And as long as you know how a couple of examples in your head, like I know a kilometer is bigger than a meter. We probably all know that hopefully, right? If not, you will. If a kilometer is bigger than a meter and it has this factor in front of it that tells me how much bigger it is so as long as i know that know that i can say okay well everything to this side is making things bigger a megameter is bigger than a meter that one seems obvious by the way it sounds right the way mega has been incorporated into public or pop culture and things like that um so a megameter is 10 to the six meters a kilometer, kilometer, is 10 to the three meters. A gigameter is 10 to the nine meters, right? And so all of those are conversions we can then write out. One gigameter equals 10 to the nine meters. And you can apply that to anything. The only place where you have to be careful with this is, and Bruce and I, Bruce on Bruce and I actually got into a disagreement a lighthearted disagreement because he made this one of the trivia questions at our all faculty day. Um, it's the only science trivia question that I missed, and I even asked him about it. He gave me a dodgy answer. Um, in computer science, a gigabyte is not 10 to the 9 bytes. It's 2 to the 20th bytes because they do things in binary in computer science. And they use giga because it's close to the same as, as 10 to the 9 bytes. It's actually like one, it's 10 to the, I'm not going to be able to come up with the number off the top of my head, but it's an even power of two bytes, um, as opposed to doing things in base 10 like the rest of the world. So if you're in computer science, pay attention, it's not strictly speaking the same, but it's the same basic principle for things like gigabytes, megabytes, hertz, things like that. And I didn't use the right words. I said, Bruce, do you mean, are you using the SI unit prefix or are you treating it like computer science? And he said, it's a gigabyte. That didn't answer my question. But gigabit is the SI unit prefix. Well, and that's just off by two to the third anyway. So, and I could have probably gotten him on that. 
doubt that he actually took the two to the third for bits to bytes in consideration. Anyway, um, we're not getting too pedantic about trivia questions. They're now three weeks in the past, so we move on. He's, he's really good at getting questions that I just barely miss sometimes. What's the, what's the, uh, the brightest star as seen from Earth? So, I actually know the other answer though. The second brightest star I've seen from Earth is Sirius. So he, he got me with the uh, the red herring there. Not that I'm still thinking that. <laughs> All right. So if we want to convert from centimeters to millimeters, well, we don't have a conversion to those centimeters to millimeters, but we have our list of prefixes. And it's even it's written down here a little bit differently, but I'm just going to grab that one from the previous page and copy and put it on this. But everybody has a conversion sheet in front of them anyway. I guess yeah, I don't need to worry about that because you don't have the conversion sheet. I just gave it to you. So. How do we get from centimeters to millimeters? You know how to do it in your head or just sort of plug it into the calculator. You can say that, but how would we show our work? So that's, that's where you're running the issues, right? You, you were right there, but you said one centimeter over 10, or you said one millimeter over. Yeah, I, I put it. You did. That's easy to do when you're not paying attention. So you always want to double check yourself before you double wreck yourself. Sorry, I could not do this. Um, that this makes sense. You know a millimeter is smaller than a centimeter, right? So you know this can't be right. So when you're using these prefixes, double check. Did I write something that actually makes sense according to reality, according to what I know? So you can do it like that. You can say 10, 10 millimeters equals one centimeter. Um, to make sure that I don't mess things up, because millimeters and centimeters isn't too bad, but if we said something like millimeters and nanometers, it's really easy to, to get yourself backed up, right? Trying to, to do that in your head. So what you can always do is say, okay, well, 10.0 centimeters, and I know that there's 100 centimeters, 10 to the two centimeters is one meter, because I have my conversion sheet with that list of prefixes. And then you can say, okay, well, now I also know that one meter is a thousand millimeters. If you just take it and take it back to meters and then apply the second prefix, do it in two steps, it'll keep you from slipping a decimal place when you're when you're trying to do this in your head. Um, so in this case, the other way you can do it is if it's these are both equal to the same thing. We can say that they're both equal to each other. So you could write 10 to the three millimeters and 10 to the two centimeters on bottom, but that's less of a universal approach. So that's the other thing to keep in mind with these, right? It says 10 to the minus three, which means a millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters. So the other way of writing this would be, a, okay, one millimeter, equals 10 to the minus three meters. But, so but that's just the inverted version. this is just the inverted version because nobody likes to think in negative exponents if you can help it, right? So in my mind, rather than say one millimeter is 1,000 of a meter, I say there's a thousand millimeters a meter. They both get you the same spot mathematically, but this one makes more sense to me in my head, the way that I think, the way I think most people do. Most people would rather do deal with bigger numbers rather than decimals, right? And so that's why where the the reasonableness check really comes in. Double check. Okay, is that how? Does that make sense? If you get it wrong, then you write something like "there's a thousand meters in a millimeter," and if you're checking it, you should be able to see that really easily, right? When you get into a hustle on test and you're feeling time pressure, you're stressed out, it's really easy to skip that double check reasonableness. Um, but I would encourage you to 
okay, get in, just get into the habit and then some extra step to go double check it. It's just like when you're writing your conversion, you should be thinking, does that make sense? All right, so 10 centimeters into millimeters is just going to be 100 millimeters, right? We're going to divide by 100, but then multiply by 1,000, and that result is we're multiplying by 10. How about 450.01 milligrams to grams? We're using milli again, right? That's going to be one of our go-tos in terms of these prefixes. Is a milligram smaller than a gram or bigger than a gram? Smaller. And you know it's milli, so it's a power of 10 to the 3. So you just have to write your conversion. You can say, okay, well, 450.01 milligrams and 10 to the 3, or 1,000 milligrams, is 1 gram. Double check. Yes, 1,000 milligrams is equal to 1 gram. That does make sense. Dollar to dividing by 1,000. Which means the same as just moving the decimal place three spots, right? So 0 0.4. Do we have to do any rounding with that one? Is this approximate or exact? It's exact. It's the definition of a milligram is that a thousand milligrams equals one gram. So it's exact. So we get to keep all of our sig figs, 0. 0.45001 grams. Um, there's some other ones on here that don't use the prefixes, but just while we're thinking about these prefixes, let's do, Let's do 25 mega feet into kilometers. It's worth pointing out right now to the capitalization in units and in variables in, in chemistry and in science is a big deal. Because if I wrote it as 25 lowercase m, feet, that's milli feet. A capital M is mega feet. Right, so we have to pay attention. But they at least were consistent enough that if it's a capitalized you, um, prefix, that means it's the bigger version of it. Um, but you see, let's see that um, M is the trickiest one, but there's also a couple others. So what's our roadmap? Let's start with mega feet to feet. Go from mega feet to feet. And where are we going to go from there? Feet to inches. And once we're in inches, centimeters to meters to kilometers. There is another way we can do this. We could go from feet to miles and miles to kilometers, but we're not using exact conversions. The other reason that I tend to stick to exact conversions is I like to memorize as little as possible. I have a decent memory at this point, but I'm also incredibly sleep deprived. So it's easier for me if I don't have to try and pull 1.609 kilometers equals one mile out from nowhere. Um, because 2.54 never changes. I'm always going to go back to 2.54 because that's been drilled into me forever. So when in doubt, I tend to go that, that way. But yes, that also would work. I mean, it, it should give us the same number within sig figs. So writing this out. Mega feet. Mega was the one past kilo, right? 
is the other reason why it's helpful to think in powers 10 to 3. If I just remember the order, it goes kilo, mega, giga, and then you start getting the bigger stuff. Then, well, if I know that kilo is 10 to the 3, I know that mega is 10 to the 6. I don't have to consult my chart. And I've been alive for enough of the development computers that I remember going from kilobytes to megabytes to gigabytes. So that order is ingrained in my head. So you can just do that, but you have to be really careful that you didn't multiply where you were supposed to divide and vice versa. So I always write it out. One megafoot is 10 to the six feet. I just, there's a dad joke in there about Bigfoot, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> and then we can go feet to inches, right? Make sure we write it the right way and that we write it so feet cancels feet. And now we're in inches. If we want to go inches to centimeters, one inch. 2.54 centimeters. That's also another one that people flip all the time. They say 2.54 inches is one centimeter. No, no. If I had a rolled up newspaper, no. Um, remember, no centimeters are smaller than an inch. Right. So get that one right. And then we can go centimeters, and it's a hundred centimeters, or ten to the two centimeters is one meter. You can write a direct conversion that goes centimeters to kilometers, but you have to add powers of 10 in your head. You have to simplify that in your head to do it, which is a place you can make it down the state, especially under stress situations. So I always write, take the step to do the extra writing and not make a mistake in my head whenever I can. And our last step here is a good example of we just ran out of room. This would be a convenient place to hit enter on your calculator and rewrite it if you were writing it. Or the, the shortcut that I will do other than just making my conversions really skinny is I'll just do this. Just to say I'm continuing this line of conversions on the next line. Um, if you do that, I know what you're, what you're doing. You just have to be careful that you don't mess up in putting into your calculator. And 10 to the three meters is one kilometer, right? So all that writing, plug it into your calculator, 25 times 10 to the six times 12 times 2.54 divided by 100. Remember, if we're just doing multiplication of fraction, anything that's on the top half, you're going to multiply by that number. Anything that's on the bottom half, you're dividing by that number. So 12 times 2.54 divided by 100 divided by 1,000. What do we get for an answer? 53 kilometers. Right, so using these prefixes really straightforward when you've got a group of people you can work with and when you're not in a stressful environment. Um, it's really easy to mess up if you haven't practiced with it much on a test. Um, but when you get the hang of it, it's, it's really powerful because you can make whatever units you need to. Um, you can have nano light years, for instance. That would be kind of a fun one. You can convert mega feet to nano light years. It should be probably pretty close to each other, actually. Anyway, um, the rest of these are just more practice. Yeah. Do we get a different number? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, 7,620? Yeah. Okay. So that's probably a calculator error. Wait, what was the one I wrote down? 53. 53. Okay. So 53 versus 7,220? 620. And 
we're only going to keep two sig figs there, right? So we would then need to put it in scientific notation to be most accurate. So 7.6 times 10 to the three kilometers. Okay, we can see what happens. Um, we, uh, you and I can talk after, after this and we'll, we'll find that algebra or arithmetic error. Um, and I, I erased it when I white out the screen and then bring it back. It doesn't say what I had written, but let's see, 25 million times 12 and I'll print the seven times 2.54, so we're still close to 10 to the seven. Yeah, it's in the thousands makes more sense to me, just looking at the powers of 10. So I, I think that that 7,000 number makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, we'll do more practice on uh, Thursday. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so for So remember that Excel doesn't do units as well. Oh. So 0.997 gram per milliliter labels it right, but Excel can't handle that. Oh, okay. So you would just have to say this one grams per milliliter. Okay. And then you have 0.997. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.